and I was applying for a freaking meteorologist position at uh, Youngstown. They had an opening, but I had a mustache at that point. So when you come up, remind me to show it to you if you haven't seen it. It's, I it's want to see good. that. It's pretty good. All right. Oh, let's go ahead and get started. Three, two, one. Let's kick it. And his name is John C. <laughs> hey, Internet. Welcome to Next Level Nerds Movie Podcast, where we share our love of movies with you. Yes, you, Phoebe Cates. Most of the time, we discuss, defend, and promote movies we enjoy that weren't considered com- critically or commercially successful. But sometimes we just ramble. So we just ask that you could do us a solid, send us all the likes and positive reviews you can afford, and be sure to share the podcast with your friends, your family, and your loved ones this holiday season. However, if you'd like to take your nerdiness to the next level, go to patreon.com slash nextlevelnerd and drop us a dollar to help us grow and improve the podcast and the overall NLN community. Patreon supporters at every level will receive exclusive bonus episodes every month. And if you can't support us with cash, show us some love by giving us a review on iTunes or wherever you cast your pod. We can also be found on Twitter at NLN Movies, Facebook.com slash Next Level Nerd, and at our homepage, NextLevelNerd.com. Now, let's jump in and nerd out. I'm Justin, he's Mitchell, and this is episode 44, Gremlins. Yeah, you love this movie. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I do love this movie, okay? Please tell me... Please tell me that sound effect is readily available at a whim's reach. You know it is. <laughs> this uh, Gremlins, I mean, for anybody, if we put this out on video, you can see me uh, wearing my Gremlins Christmas sweater, which I love. Um, yeah. It's probably the best sweater I've ever seen in my whole life, regardless that it's a Christmas sweater, but still. Right. I think this movie is... Um, it's it's one of the movies that formed me. I'll say that as, oh, a, wow. as a child. Um, you know, it really uh, helped introduce me to the the uh, horror comedy genre, uh, and in a big way compared to something like uh, Ghostbusters or you know something along those lines. Um, but yeah, this one was released in uh, June. Of 84, June 8th, 1984, which seems like a strange time to release this movie because it very much is a Christmas movie as well. Absolutely. There's a lot of people that review Christmas movies and do YouTube videos based on this being a Christmas movie. So absolutely. Yeah. And the uh, the MPAA, the Motion Picture Association of America, gave this a rating of PG which we'll get into why the controversy around that a little bit later. Is it me or is the MPAA a bunch of old stuck up? Settle. Okay. Okay. (laughs) You leave them alone. (laughs) They do good. Uh, (laughs) Take that, Mr. MPAA. But we've got a runtime on this bippy of... um, one hour, I must said a minute and 46 seconds. One hour and 46 minutes. So it's right around that, that sweet holiday special time of 90 minutes, just a bit over uh, for my Christmas movies. You know, the type of movie I like to watch over and over. Yeah, usually, a- usually you're at a sweet 84 minutes per the VHS. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the limitations of that technology. Uh, the critical response is actually <laughs> is actually really good. Uh, yeah, all the, all around, it's really good. God bless around. everyone. Everyone loves it. Everyone loves it universally, pretty much. It's an eighty four percent on the tomato meter with an audience score of seventy eight, which kind of surprised me that the audience didn't love it more. 
Um, this doesn't seem like it would be a critical darling. Uh, you know, like this seems like more of a, a fan movie than a critic movie. Yes, I agree. But uh, Metacritic gave it a 70 out of 100 on their scale. And there was no cinema score for this one. There is for the second crit, uh, Critters, Gremlins movie. I was reading a uh, article today that was talking about the Critters. Um, the reboot? Television show. Yeah, it's coming through some like Verizon streaming service. Everybody's uh, got a stream service. Yeah, that's weird. But okay, not unheard of in 2018. Yeah. I well, think my, so- my uncle just started his own streaming service. Yeah, I, I'd like to go to the bathroom and be like, oh, this streaming service, it's so good. <laughs> so we had a, uh, a budget of $11 million on this one, mm-hmm. but a box office of $153 Is that considered a, blo- a blockbuster? What's a blockbuster, Justin? Uh, I would think so. I think the, I think the actual blockbuster... Where that term came from was, I think Jaws, I want to say, was the first movie to uh, crack half a billion in uh, box office. And I think that's where the term uh, blockbuster came from. But uh, yeah, the uh, the box office take was quite a bit more than the $11 million budget. Yeah, that's like 10 times. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Usually we're in the uh, we're in the red when we're talking about movies. Yeah, well, you know, we usually cover movies that uh, that aren't um, critically or commercially successful. So, well, not everyone liked this movie, and I can understand why, just based on the this, what I've seen. And the movie itself, and why they had to change the rating. Thank you, MPAA. Whatever. Yeah, but, you know, so why are we reviewing this movie? Well, because Gremlins is one of my favorite Christmas movies, and I want to spread some damn joy. And also, like I said, this is one of those movies that uh, played a big part in me falling in love with movies. So, um, you know, I think everybody has those those uh 50 or 60 movies that really made them love movies if they like movies you know so so this movie really resonated with you huh yes it did my brother used to watch this one uh over and over and it 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 felt like it was a a forbidden fruit of a sort you know because it was it seemed like something I shouldn't be watching, but it was a kid's movie. So Okay, okay, yeah. I can see that. So this felt like my first adult film, you know, using the, the little kid parlance. So the taglines on this one, cute, clever, mischievous, intelligent, dangerous. Uh, what you see isn't always what you get. <laughs> okay, funny. Continue. Yeah. That's They're great. Not great. The Gremlins are coming, which <laughs> I like. I like that one. That one to me just screams like fifties B horror movie, like something you'd see across a poster like that from the forties or fifties. Oh yeah, that's the best one yet. Don't get him wet. Keep him out of bright light, and never feed him after midnight. Ooh, a little rhyming and mysteriousness to that. Yeah. The last one I have here, they didn't obey the rules. Whoa. That's just dynamite. Uh, The movie was uh, written by Chris Columbus, who you might remember from The Goonies. And also Uh, discovering America, apparently in 1492. That old joke. Anyways, go on. Anyways. Yeah, uh, Gremlins 2, The New Batch, she directs the sequel to this one, which is also on our list, but because of its critical rating. Um, Hopefully we get to that one day. But uh, he's mostly known for directing uh, films like uh, Adventures in Babysitting, Home Alone 1 and 2, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, Harry Potter 1 and 2, 
And the two fa- 2005 movie version of the Broadway play, or musical, I guess you'd say, Rent, which that seems really out of place. It does, but that was a really good movie. Mm. I never cared for the for the musical. Neither and- did I, but I randomly, when I was living with my brother in Ohio, and there was a thing called the cheap seats. You paid a dollar to go see a movie. Yeah, they have like this. They- had a movie theater with new releases, and then after so long, they had put them in a different theater where you can pay a dollar to go see stuff that's been out for however long. We went to go see Rent, and we were like, yeah, we smuggled in booze into the theater, but we were <laughs> like, this is actually really good. And we were yeah. sing- singing all the songs, yeah, 500, 25,600 <laughs> minutes Something, okay. something. How do you measure a year? Yeah, in diapers, in cups of coffee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it was directed by uh, Joe Dante. Dante, um, yeah. He gets all the, the accolades and the flack. And you know what? I realized that he directed the Burbs, too. Yeah. He directed uh, Inner Space, The Howling, uh, wow, Small wow, Soldiers, wow, wow. Whoa. The Birds, Gremlins 2, he does the sequel, and he also worked on a segment on the Twilight Zone movie, and Piranha, the original. Never saw the original, I only saw the uh, Jerry O'Connell remake. The Double Ds, in 3 Double D. Yeah. And I love, wait, wait, Jerry O'Connell. Yeah, that's right. Okay. We'll say it is. Nobody's going to look it up. I was almost like Neil, Neil O'Donnell, 1996 flashback. (laughs) So uh, we get a genius score from Jerry Goldsmith. Um, I've had the, the Gremlin theme song like stuck in my head all week and just love the the how he makes it sound like it's an auditory delight of the gremlins having their own like crazy <laughs> anthem that they play when they're like out doing gremlin shit yeah that's a good point that i mean it's their theme song is definitely well done i mean it's very well rounded. It's menacing, is what it yeah. is. It's menacing. It's, yeah, good call. But there's also some Christmas music sprinkled in there for good measure. So Hoyt Axton plays Randall Peltzer, the dad. And the only thing I could find on this dude that really piqued my interest was he wrote the Three Dog Night song, Joy to the World. Like, he was a musician. And, uh, he I mean, if you listen to his voice, you could maybe hear him being like a country singer or something. And, yeah, this was like one of the only movies he did. But Wow. Yeah. Francis Lee McCain as Lynn Peltzer. Billy's mom, and she was Mrs. Lachance in Stand By Me, Marty's grandmother in Back to the Future, and Ren McCormick's mom in Footloose. So get this. This chick's resume contains Footloose, Back to the Future, Stand By Me, and fucking Gremlins. Like, that is an all-star lineup. But those are, like, the only movies I could find her in. Well, that's amazing, and that's... I'm. Glad you referenced her, what she's been working on. And you know what? Her headshot from, I don't know when it was taken, but she is a total babe. You lay off it, man. That's Marty's grandma. (laughs) (laughs) Come and eat your dinner. So uh, Zach Galligan as Billy Peltzer and... Corey Feldman, that's right. Feldman alert. Feldman, he'll sneak up on you. He just it, pops up out of nowhere. He will, as Pete Fontaine. And he's the this neighbor kid that hangs out at Billy's house. Uh, obviously, Corey Feldman, Stand By Me, The Burbs, TMNT, the original one. 
Lost Boys, Goonies, Friday the 13th, the final chapter. Mm, one of the best ones. Yeah, he tears all his hair out. Uh, Dick Miller as Murray Futterman. He's the uh, pawn shop broker in Terminator, but also you know him best as Mitchell, the garbage man in the Burbs. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of Burbs connections here. Howie Mandel as Gizmo, which this is the one I always forget. Um, wow, wow. Great reference. Yeah. Howie Mandel, Little Monsters, Bobby's World, Walk Like a Man, which is also like a, a really uh, early movie that like live action movie that I got into when I was a kid. Christopher Lloyd and him. And he's like taken away and raised by wolves. He comes back and his name's Bobo. Bobo, yeah. <laughs> and also, Howie Mandel was on the Muppet Babies. Okay, I can I can see that. Yeah, he played Skeeter and a couple other characters. He was a good voice actor. He still is. Yeah, he is. Well, Mitchell, Judge Reinhold, bitches. The huh? honorable, the honorable Judge Reinhold. Okay. From Stripes, Beverly Hills Cop One, Two, and Three, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, coincidentally with Phoebe Cates, where he's jerking off to her, uh, and the Santa Claus. Oh, that's right. Yeah, he plays that dickhead bank worker who really shoves it in or lays it on a little too hard, in my opinion. Yeah, 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 Gerald. <laughs> So, Gerald, come on, Gerald. Phoebe Cates, uh, who you've seen in Drop Dead Fred, Gremlins 2, and Mr. Skin Alert, The Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Mm -hmm. She comes out of that fucking pool, and you hear uh, the cars moving in stereo. Bum, 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 na, na, na. Yeah. I, I used to have a hardcore crush like... Angelina Jolie or Jennifer Connelly crush on her until no. Gremlin, until Gremlins Two. Once yeah. Gremlins Two came out, I'm like, you know what? She's she's all right. You fell off the Phoebe Cates train? Yeah, I did. Oh, she's one of my ladies from the '80s. Right up there, Elizabeth Shue, Jennifer Connelly. Uh, uh, we're gonna go Phoebe Cates, obviously. Jennifer Connelly's the big one. Uh, I, you know, Elizabeth Shue gets better and better. I was watching The Saint with her and Val oh, night. Love that movie. Oh, she's a total babe. I mean, Hollow Man, Kevin Bacon. Yeah. Again, amazing. But I don't know what it is about Phoebe Cates and sequels or just going past, like, whatever era it was that she was yeah. filming in. I mean, she's still a total babe. She's just not of that. She's not in very many films as of late. Yeah, good point. I'd like for Phoebe Cates to come back in a big way. Like uh, Leah Thompson. That's another lady of the 80s. Debbie Harry from fucking Blondie. Oh, man. Oh, my goodness. Get out of my head, bro. Get out of it. I saw her when she was on uh, Mad TV as a musical guest. Blondie was on there. And she was like... It it had been like a long time since I saw her, and she was kind of big boned, and I was like, "Oh my god, she's still so hot!" Like she had put on the pounds, but you know, I I, I hope she's she lost the weight and is doing well. Debbie, if you're out there, girlfriend, call me. So there's also some uh, voice work from Michael Winslow. What? Yeah, yes, from from uh, Police Academy. Uh, Peter Motormouth, Cullen, yeah. Motormouth Jones himself. Yeah, Peter Cullen and Frank Welker. Oh wow! Okay, so some heavy hitters. Yeah, and we also get a little cameo from the famous Warner Brothers animator Chuck Jones. He's the dude at the bar that Billy's. Uh, like Billy goes to the bar and he starts drawing because he wants to be like a comic book artist or something. And this guy's like, oh, I like what you did there or something. And he's like, thanks, Mr. Jones. It's Chuck Jones. Fucking drew, drew some of the best cartoons you've ever seen. Anyway. Really? I didn't realize they had so many 
I mean, I knew that the movie was good and okay. all the references, but I didn't realize like Welker was involved and Chuck Jones. That's that's dynamite. Damn right it is. So Mitchell, as far as the critical reviews, if you could bring us up to speed. All right, let me give you some insight as to what people said about what they didn't like about it. And mind you, it's it's going to be a stretch. Yeah, yeah, because most of the reviews are positive. So, All right, let's start with the New York Times. Gremlins is far more interested in showing off its knowledge of movie lore and making random jokes than in providing consistent entertainment. Okay. I, I mean, that sounds like it could have been a review for Loaded Weapon. Uh, the, the, all of, <laughs> the reviews I'm going to reference here are very convoluted, and then I'm going to go on to Entertainment Weekly, which is by far my favorite. All right, so here's referencing uh, the director, Joe Dante. Dante is perhaps the first filmmaker since Frank Tashlin to base his style on the formal free-for-all of animated cartoons. He is also utterly heartless. Wow, they didn't okay. like it. No, no, okay, so I think I'm going to steer away from the uh, the specific jabs at Joe Dante. I don't think are relevant to what we're talking about, even though they're kind of like, they boil my blood a little bit, because stop shitting on this guy, because he made, like, so much, like, the, the things he produced in his day, you can go... F yourself. Yeah, your career does not uh, does not live up to his. All right, so from uh, you know what I'm not even gonna name where this one comes from. Spoof horror doesn't horrify; it sickens. Spoof comedy doesn't amuse; it annoys. Spoof comic horror is for the stuffed birds. This is not a spoof film. All right, so. This They're one, making uh, they make these critics that don't like it make it sound like it's a spoof film. All right, that person was from the UK. Right? Oh well. So now you understand. Um, here's another review. We're which, Americans, damn it! We still hold it against those British for what they did. Filmcritic.com says it's probably a surefire hit with popcorn and a six pack of beer on a Saturday night. You're right, it is. Hell yeah, it is. <laughs> what isn't? <laughs> All right, so... I That's... want to read to you what, what they start saying from Entertainment Weekly. Bring it. Uh, the film was called Icky and Gross. And this was uh, the film critic, critic, Leonard Martin, who disapproved of the, of the film. Mm. Uh, he later wrote, after that, a wild review there. Despite being set in a picture postcard town and blending the feel of It's a Wonderful Life, which is a clip that appeared in the film, mm -hmm. the film is, quote-unquote, negated by too vivid violence and mayhem. Giving the film, He gave the film two out of four stars. Ouch. But that particular critic made a cameo in Gremlins 2. Yeah, kind of, he did. Kind of spoofing that. Gremlins 2? Oh, I can't wait till we get there. Wait, wait, there's more. Oh. Okay, so this movie went a lot of philosoph a lot of people were philosophizing this film about <laughs> how like this reflects like Westerners and how <laughs> you let me just read this while some critics criticized the film's depictions of violence and greed, such as death scenes, Kate's speech and the gremlins got me for lack of comic value. Scholar Charlotte Miller instead interpreted these as satire of some characteristics of Western civilization, suggesting that Westerners may take too much satisfaction from violence. Gremlins can also be interpreted as a statement against technology. In some characters, such as Billy's father, are overly dependent on it. 
In contrast, Mr. Wing is shown to have a strong distaste for television. Wow. That goes on. It's also interpreted Gremlins as an anti-technology film. And Do not drop acid and watch Gremlins, or that's what you'll come away with. Okay, so this author who authored the book <clears throat> Rebels Against the Future, and they, keep, they continue going on, and they suggest that the film is meant to express a number of observations of society by having the Gremlin characters shift in what they are meant to represent. At different times, they are depicted as teenagers, the wealthy establishment, or, this is the best one, or fans of Disney films. <laughs> what? How the hell did you get all that out of Gremlins? I'm just reading, thankfully, what they're philosophizing about <laughs> in their su summarization in Wikipedia. Thank you. That's amazing. It's so amazing. Somebody, somebody, yeah, that's somebody's thesis right there. Somebody was basing their doctorate off of, <laughs> off of uh, their writing on gremlins. Look, we all know you can major in Game Boy if you know how to bullshit. <laughs> Good one. So, uh, yeah, let's break it down. So... The movie opens up, Rand Peltzer is narrating the story about how during work as a traveling salesman of his own inventions during the holidays, he stopped into a mysterious shop in Chinatown, and he's looking for a Christmas present for his son, uh, something truly extraordinary, and the one thing that catches his eye is this small creature owned by the shopkeeper, and he inquires about uh, purchasing it. But the old man who owns the shop is reluctant to sell the Mogwai due to the amount of responsibility of owning one. And we get to see what that's like. So the shopkeeper's grandson meets Mr. Peltzer outside and sells him the Mogwai. And the boy lays out the now iconic three rules of the Mogwai. You don't expose it to bright light. You don't get it wet. And never feed it after midnight. And I just freaking love the vague after midnight rule. You know, like people always make jokes about it. Like, what if we're on an airplane and we cross time zones? You know, shit like that. Um, and these rules aren't impervious to logic. But I, I just love that they don't spend too much time overthinking it. It just gives it more of that B-movie feel. Amen to that. Absolutely. That was I have like... 12 questions based on time zones. So you just right. put that. You put that right to bed. Thank you. Yeah. And if time's a man-made construct, then how do they know? Yeah. There's so much. So we cut to uh, Peltzer's hometown, uh, Kingston Falls, USA. <laughs> That's the only, the only description they give you, which I love. Uh, because it's it, this is the wholesome little slice of Americana preparing for Christmas right here. And they're selling Christmas trees in the town square, and the small town is buzzing. Uh, and just then we see Billy Peltzer trying to get his VW bug to start so he can get to work. Uh, but Billy can't get it running, and he ends up walking to work through the snow to his job at the bank, and for some reason decides to take his dog Barney with him. Like, the weird thing about this movie is I can't figure out how old Zach Galligan's supposed to be. Like, is he supposed to be, like, in high school? Because he kind of goes to the high school. <laughs> and is he supposed to... I mean, he has a job at a bank. Um, you know, one of, one of his co-workers says that he's 23, but he also hangs out with the local 10-year-old on his block. So I have a lot of questions. But anyways, don't overthink it. It's fucking gremlins. So we see at his bank job that his co-worker, Kate, is played by Phoebe Cates. Uh, and this rich old uh, Scrooge-type character, this, this dusty old cunt, uh, Mrs. Deagle, comes busting ass through town to chew Billy's ass. Oh, I, I hate her. Yeah, B because she's saying that his dog broke some stupid fucking lawn ornament of hers. And she wants to take his dog away and have him put down and... She really reminds me of Mrs. Gulch from The Wizard of Oz when she tries to go after Toto. 
You know, nice. and I think she even does the I'll get you, but she doesn't say my pretty. Good reference. So uh, Barney, uh, the dog, hops the bank counter and knocks this old bitch on her ass. Billy's boss shows up to help her off her ass and is like, oh, what's that dog doing here? And then smarmy Judge Nelson, Nelson, some would say the best kind of Judge Nelson, uh, also yells at Billy Peltzer, this is a bank, Peltzer, not a pet store. To which his boss responds, very good, Gerald, as if he's giving the lapdog a bone. Uh, and later on at the local watering hole, Billy's working hard on his artwork and he's drawing with uh, Chuck Jones. And Gerald shows shows up and tells him that he needs to get his shit together and conform or he's going to be left with his pants down and his ass in the breeze. And Judge Nelson just plays this role like every other 1980s yuppie stereotype where he thinks he's like simply better than people because of his money and his prospects. And uh, so Kate comes over. She's waiting tables there at the bar in the evenings. And Gerald asks her, come on. Or he, he asks her out. And uh, he's like, you know, we should go back to my place. Come on. We're talking cable. <laughs> and <laughs> she totally just shoots him down. He's like a total Gaston character from Beauty and the Beast. He's just nice. so just so deliciously sycophantic. That's the word of the day. Sycophantic. Mm. I like how you uh, made him a Gaston character. He That's is. Per- that's perfect for this particular movie and story. Yeah. So Billy goes home and helps his mom with dinner. And Mr. Peltzer finally gets home from his sales trip with his gift for Billy. And he has him open it right away. And we get our first look at the insanely adorable Mogwai Gizmo. Yay. So when his mom takes a uh, picture, the flash scares the hell out of Gizmo. And so the dad gives him the three rules. No light, water, or food after midnight. The next morning... uh, Corey Feldman shows up with their Christmas tree delivery and Billy introduces him to Gizmo who's watching an old race car movie on TV and Pete accidentally or uh, Corey Feldman's character Pete accidentally spills some water that Billy's paintbrushes were soaking in on Gizmo and he starts fucking crumping and twerking and these little fuzzy dryer balls are shooting off his back and land all around the room and they start growing into five other mogwais. So Corey Feldman tries to pet one with a stripe on its head and it snaps at him. And Billy notices that Gizmo is like really upset about something. So he goes to tell his old man about how he fucked up and got the damn thing wet. And he tells him it multiplies with water and shows him all these goofy fucking creatures causing cute little mayhem all around their house. And at this point, you're like, oh, man, this is a great movie. These cute, these things are fucking adorable. So Mr. Peltzer, he's just coming in his pants thinking of ways he can get rich selling these things. <laughs> <laughs> and that night, uh, Billy wakes up because he hears Barney whining. And he finds his dog tied up to their porch with Christmas lights. And he suspects that that old bitch, uh, Mrs. Deagle is the one responsible for it. Like, you saw that frail-ass old lady. I don't think she's going to come down and tie your fucking dog up with Christmas lights to your the side of your house. Yeah, nobody does that. Not these days. Mogwais do it, but not humans. Not humans. So the next morning, he uh, takes Gizmo to the high school and shows the biology teacher how they multiply with water. And the biology teacher takes a blood sample from the Mogwai and pretty much pisses it off. So Billy goes to the bar. Yeah, why would you take it to the biology teacher? I mean, especially that guy. Like, he was too busy. He, excuse me, he was way too busy eating sandwiches, anyways. Yeah, he did enjoy a good sandwich. So uh, Billy goes over to the bar and finds his neighbor, Mr. Futterman, is still there while Kate is trying to close up. And he's talking to Mr. Futterman's talking about how much he hates foreigners and how they put gremlins in their cars and are 
and their technology and all the shit they ship to America. And he's like this really old, like World War II veteran racist that just hates everything that's not American and talks about the little gremlins inside of machines and stuff. I mean, he's everybody's drunk uncle. The one you block on Facebook. <laughs> so he, he walks home or he walks, uh, Billy walks Kate home and they talk about how a lot of people like Mr. Futterman are down on their luck and get depressed around the holidays. And Kate says that she hates Christmas and doesn't celebrate it. And she gets really defensive when Billy asks her why, but then he asks her out on a date and she agrees and they decide they're going to go out on a date. So yeah, the the story of Kate's dad uh, and what happened at Christmas is coming up. But at this point, it's just kind of a it it really feels like this insane reveal, like the biggest reveal of the movie to me. <laughs> but uh, you know, it, it, I don't know. It it feels like the stakes on that were much higher than the stakes in this movie. Um. So back at his house, Billy and Gizmo are watching Invasion of the Body Snatchers, which is kind of foreshadowing the upcoming pod scene. And uh, the other Mogwais start acting up, so Billy decides to feed them because it's only like 11.30 or some shit. And over at the school, the biology, biology teacher is still running tests on the Mogwai, and he leaves his sandwich behind, and the little fucker eats it. Idiots. I mean, who leaves a sandwich on the counter like that? Crazy asshole. I, I, no one in real life. No one. Honestly. I don't. I don't think I've ever picked up a sandwich and put anything down. To be honest with you, if I'm picking up a sandwich, I'm eating that fucking thing. We ain't setting it back down. I ain't well, going they, back for chips. Nothing. They do this in Hollywood in several movies where they put sandwiches down and it's. It's suggestive and helps the story along, but you know what? F that. Yeah. F that. I'm living in real life. I'm eating a sandwich. I ain't putting that shit down. I don't put a sandwich down. I, no. I pick up food. I put nothing down. That's unless it's like a chicken bone or something like that. But you know, we talking sandwiches here, motherfucker. Sandwich. You, yeah. You finish your sandwich. Once you start the sandwich, the rest of the meal is just sandwich. Or put it on a napkin or something up on a filing cap cabinet where a demon isn't going to capture it. I yeah. mean, that's just, that's, I, maybe that's just me. I'd be pissed, man. If I ever had to put down a sandwich, say like my, my legs were on fire, <laughs> but it's like, oh, you got to put down that sandwich. I'd be like, ah, fuck. But, like, I wouldn't put that sandwich anywhere anyone else could get it, man. Like, my instincts of – my survival instincts would kick in, and I'd be, like, hiding that sandwich up real high where no one else could get it. Well, that's the thing. You either finish eating the sandwich or where do you, wherever you put it, you're, you're not – that sandwich is no longer your, your yeah. sandwich. Protect, that's the thing. Protect your sandwich is the real message of this movie, I think. I think – that, it's a cautionary tale. Yeah, you're 100% right. So Billy calls his mom up to his room, and there's all these slimy pods all over the place, and he supposes that that it's the Mogwise, obviously. But uh, when he checks his clock, he realizes his alarm clock's been fucked with, like the wires are all chewed. And so he realizes that he did end up feeding them after midnight. Bum, bum, bum. Whoopsie. Yeah. So Billy and, and uh, Pete, Corey Feldman's character, go to the high school uh, where the biology teacher is having the same problem with his mogwai. And he says it's like a pupa stage where the creature grows goes through a metamorphosis. So at the bank the next morning, I guess, Mrs. Deagle comes to deposit a check and she just keeps fucking with Billy about his dog. And at this point, you know, the writers are kind of signaling to you, this bitch is going to get it, right? You're not this much of an asshole in a movie and get away with it. Like, you don't survive, man. 
shit's shit's going down. Yeah, she's done for. Absol- absolutely. So all the pods start fucking hatching while Gizma looks on in, in terrified horror. And even the one at the school starts to break open and release all the gremlins inside. And the teacher calls Billy to let him know that the gremlin hatched. However, it's loose somewhere in the classroom, so he tries to lure it out with a candy bar. And the tension in this scene is palpable. This is when it turns into a horror movie, right here. And suddenly it attacks him and, you know, just cuts, like, goes after him and it cuts away. Like, we never see the gremlin. We just kind of hear it. And Billy enters into the room... uh, to find him dead with a syringe in his ass, apparently angry about having his blood taken. And Billy uh, reaches for the phone but gets scratched by the gremlin and sees that the his claw comes up over the desk and sees that the, that the uh, creatures escaped through a vent and only sees, like, the claw marks on the wall and stuff. Like, they, they don't show the shark. I love it. So, uh, which is our, our term for, you know, Jaws. Don't show the shark until it's time to show the fucking shark. So uh, when he goes to the nurse's station to get a bandage, the damn gremlin hops out of the closet and scares the shit out of me every time because I always forget, like, where is this thing? And I always it freaks me out that it's right by his face. And that's our first reveal of what the gremlins look like. And they are fucking beautiful. The creature design is ridiculous. Like, I don't think this movie gets enough credit for making, like, Muppets basically look horrifying at times. That's a good point. They are horrifying. Yeah. So back at home, the gremlins are... uh, causing a ruckus and fucking with Gizmo. They toss him down the laundry chute, and Mrs. Peltzer goes to investigate, and this is when the movie just kicks it to... kicks it into the, the horror film stratosphere because she finds the empty pods, and just then, Billy calls to tell her, get out of the house, get out of the house, but the gremlins cut the phone lines. So now it's like a home invasion movie, and suddenly she hears Christmas music playing, that do you hear what I hear? And, you know, it's it's kind of a creepy song anyways. Uh, but she goes to investigate as we see Billy is running home uh, to make sure she's safe. And she sees the turntable was on and then something uh, throws something at her from a, another room. And she's got this butcher knife and stalks around the house until she finds one of the gremlins eating Christmas cookies. And... Uh, she stuffs him in the blender, uh, then using a TV tray as a shield, makes her way to the next gremlin, and she just stabs the motherfucker with a knife. Like, it's so violent. This is, this is not a kid's movie. Like, this shit right here is just gruesome, because the next kill, she puts one in the fucking microwave, and it explodes. And the kill, the kills in this movie are spectacular. And if you think about it, this is really like one of the first movies, uh, or for me, this was one of the first movies as a kid where I got to see the kills of a horror movie, you know, um, even though they were being perpetuated against the bad guy, uh, they were still fucking gruesome. Yeah, they're, I was very disgusted by all of the kills, but you know what? I was still entertained entertained and that's a lot of the the flack that the movie gets is everyone's like yeah it's so gory blah 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 but have you ever killed a gremlin have you ever killed a gremlin i have not sir exactly you don't know how gory it is yeah you're over there setting your fucking sandwich down in all the wrong places i have a screwdriver a straight slot screwdriver in my hand right now and all i'm thinking about (laughs) is Stabbing a gremlin. <laughs> That's pretty good. But you don't know. You don't know if they exist. You don't even know if they're gonna be here. Happy yeah. Happy Halloween. It's actually Christmas, motherfucker. <laughs> so uh Billy's mom thinks she sees one in a stocking hanging by the fire, but it's a classic horror film fake out. It was just a toy. 
uh, and it was like some wind up robot or some shit. And then one jumps out from the fucking Christmas tree and it's amazing. And it tries to, uh, strangle her with the, with the Christmas lights. And then, uh, Billy shows up and cuts its head off with this, uh, decorative sword, uh, that hangs on their wall and the head falls into the fireplace and it just like, as it dies, so Billy uh, takes his mom to their doctor's house and he goes back home to find Gizmo in the laundry. And Billy puts Gizmo in his backpack and then they go gremlin hunting, bitch. They track him down to the local YMCA where Stripe has jumped in the pool. And this effect and this oh shit moment are just fucking glorious. Because you know this town is about to be overrun by these damn things. And so Billy goes to the sheriff, who, if you've ever seen a movie, you know, doesn't believe him about the gremlins. Because who's going to believe the kid or the old man or whatever, you know, about this crazy thing that's going on. Uh, Just then, though, a gremlin army is flooding into the streets. And I think that's the first time we get the... The music, the gremlins theme playing. And Billy's neighbor, Mr. Futterman, is at home watching TV with his wife. But his signal goes out and he goes to look at the end the tv antenna which is that that right there dates this movie for me so perfectly like the technology in this movie makes me nostalgic uh for like my pre-kindergarten years a little bit um because i remember like having to uh, fix the antenna on the house and stuff like that and uh you know some of the some of the toys and stuff that they show in this movie and the technology it's just like good early 80s man so um mr futterman goes outside and his pride and joy his american made tractor bursts through the garage door and the gremlin drivers wreck it into his house and he and his wife flee in fear screaming about gremlins uh they make it look like they kill the futtermans here but we know that they don't die because they're in the sequel. They they make them look like they have an off-screen kill uh, the way that they're driving the, the tractor towards them. So, the gremlins go on an uh, all-night bender of anarchy, mayhem, and antics, fucking with mailboxes and streetlights and giving Mrs. Deagle, the, old, the bitchy old cat lady, her comeuppance. They scare the shit out of her and put a fucking hyperdrive on her Stairmaster thing, which shoots this old bitch out the window, leaving that dusty old nasty piece of shit dead in the street. And they start attacking some dude dressed as Santa. They cut the brake line on the sheriff's squad car, causing him to wreck. It's fucking pandemonium on the streets of Kingston Falls. But Billy even, uh, he turns on the radio and he hears the studio getting broken into and the DJ's killed, which I thought was just a funny, like something you never really see in a horror movie uh, or a comedy for that matter. So over at the local bar, the gremlins are going buck fucking wild, smoking, drinking, fighting, hitting on chicks, doing lines of blow in the bathroom, playing pool and poker, even pulling guns on motherfuckers. These dudes are amazing it's like a night out with charlie sheen only with slightly less chances of waking up with aids so kate uh who's been serving all these things till now because that's what you do figures out that bright light fucks them up like most bar flies and uh she uses the flash on a camera to fight them off until billy shows up shining his headlights inside the building And they try to escape, but his shitty car won't start, so they head off on foot. And uh, they duck into the completely wrecked bank, and Billy explains everything to Kate, who says, Now I have another reason to hate Christmas, and here comes the big reveal. She tells Billy why she hates Christmas, and it's completely fucked up. Her dad one year dressed up like Santa and tried to come down the chimney before Christmas, but slipped and broke his fucking neck 
and stayed wedged in the chimney for several days before he was found. And that's how she found out there was no Santa. What the fuck? This is a PG movie? No, 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 no. Why would they include include that? Mm. It's such a fucking kick in the teeth. Like, that right there is like... That is a movie into itself. Like, that is just straight up horror. Like, that's the darkest turn in this movie, in my opinion. Um, But damn, is it dark. So, they make their way to the movie theater and see that the gremlins have all made their way inside due due to the abundance of food, dark rooms, and of course, Snow White. And they are fucking riveted by this movie and singing along, carrying on in the theater. And the thing that that made me wonder is, this is obviously a Warner Brothers movie. How did they get the rights to show Snow White in the theater? I mean, good question. They played they played nice in the past. You know, they after this movie they played uh, nice together with um, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. But I mean, just seems like. That's that's a big step right there. So Billy and Kate sneak into the boiler room of the movie theater in order to give them the old inglorious bastards treatment. Uh, but Stripe goes to the lobby and sees that the, the theater's out of candy, so he goes across the street to get more. And they burn the theater to the ground and send these things back to hell. It's badass. Flaming gremlins dying all over the place. You hear the screams and the cries, and it's fucking amazing. Uh, Just then, Kate sees that Stripe is in the store across the street, and so they break in and go go after him, knowing that he's uh, the last gremlin, and he's heading for water. So Billy gives Gizmo to Kate and plants a big smackaroo on her before going hunting for this mohawked little fucker. And Stripe is taunting him and even calls his ass out for a showdown. He, Billy, across the intercom and on the cameras and shit. And Kate goes to find the controls for the building lights. And Stripe does the old uh, E.T. hiding among the stuffed animals trick right next to an E.T. doll. But yo, 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 check it out, check it out. Fuck that movie. Fuck E.T. You know I don't roll with E.T. Mm-hmm. Oh, we know. I ain't going to get into it right now, but fuck E.T. So Stripe uh, shows up pitching saw blades at Billy and then takes off on a tricycle. uh, And Kate notices that Gizmo is gonzo. And Billy grabs a baseball bat and starts hunting after Stripe. But Stripe starts shooting at him with a pitching machine and knocks him on his ass and puts a bolt in his arm from a fucking crossbow. And then he starts coming at Billy with a fucking chainsaw. Like, this is badass. This is amazing. He's This little creature is going hard. He's out for blood. But Billy blocks the chainsaw with the baseball bat, but we don't know for how long... But it's cool because Gizmo is uh, cruising across the store in a remote control car just as Kate finds the lights and uh, blinds Stripe. And he finds a water fixture in uh, the department store and a gun. And he's ready to fuck shit up. So he's standing there over this water fountain firing shots at Billy. And just as he's about to put his hand in the water, Gizmo shows up and opens the skylights to this garden center. And Stripe melts into a disgusting puddle of boogers and scabs and other cucky stuff that makes you want to puke. And he topples over into the water and this skeleton-looking pus blob hops out of the water. And it's like... (laughs) And then just gasps its last breath. Uh, But Billy is watching the news with his parents the next night. And uh, he's there with Gizmo and Kate and his mom and dad. And just then the... uh, the Chinese shopkeeper shows up and takes Gizmo back with him, and he scolds Mr. Peltzer for his arrogance. And before he leaves, Mr. Peltzer apologizes. Then his narration offers a warning to the viewers to be on the lookout for gremlins in your VCR, in your car, wherever, or perhaps even a new batch. Ooh. Ooh. 
So, Mitchell, yeah, this movie is absolutely fantastic in all the ways that a movie should be. It's funny. It's scary. It's got tension. It's got romance. It's got Phoebe Cates. What She's else hot. do you need? Exactly. So, Mitchell, without further ado, unless you have something to add, I'm going to go on a rant. Well tried. Well tried. It's a fair attempt. Turn it off now. <laughs> so anyways, this movie was partially responsible for the PG-13 rating, along with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Honestly, it is not a kid's movie. But it has all the charm and fun of a kid's movie. It teeters on that line between cute and violent. And while the Mogwai are adorable animatronics and puppets, which spark the imagination and creativity, they're juxtaposed against the legitimacy or the legitimately looking, creepy looking gremlins. Legitimately creepy looking gremlins. There we go. However, it is so funny to see the gremlins with which are on par with any iconic film monsters engaging in hilariously offbeat and cartoonish behavior. I mean, these terrifying creatures are just doing weird, wild, and wacky stuff, you know? And when I first first saw this movie, I must have been like five or six, and I was immediately drawn to Gizmo, but the intrigue of this being my first horror movie made me feel like that, that forbidden fruit that I talked about, something inside of me said, I should not be seeing this, but I could not look away. And like I said, my brother loved this movie when we were little, and every time he would watch it, I was glued to the TV. And even you know times when he wasn't around, I would put it on and watch it. And Gremlins is... Just this deliciously wonderful blend of sophisticated B-movies. It has like the ancient Chinese mysticism of movies like Big Trouble in Little China. It plays on all the tropes of 1950s sci-fi invasion movies like The Blob, War of the Worlds, or The Invasion of the Body Snatchers. And it takes place... It takes its place among other genre-bending horror comedies like Ghostbusters, Little Shop of Horrors, American Werewolf in London, and Beetlejuice. But it's also a wonderful alternative Christmas movie like Black Christmas, Krampus, Die Hard, Iron Man 3, and Lethal Weapon, to name a few. But most of all, it stands alone as one of the most fun movies ever made. You can tell the filmmakers enjoyed their time writing and making this movie, and throughout my life, it has brought me nothing but pure, unadulterated joy. And I'll admit my heavy, nostalgic bias towards this movie, but it seems I'm not alone in my love for it based on these reviews. So for making a movie that I love to watch over and over, especially around Christmas, we thank you, a dear filmmakers. Yay. Tally ho, tally ho, And we agree. Yeah, I mean, this one's this one's universally loved for the well, I mean I hate to say universally, but it's it's as universal as universal gets. So unless you have anything else to add, Mitchell. No, that's good. I completely agree with you. This one is definitely one that people love and a lot of different people love for different reasons. Right. And I I love it. I love all the people that love it too. You know I love it. You know yeah. I love it. It's so weird. It's a weird one, but yeah, we're, it's definitely cool. It, it it has its spot in pop culture because of why the reasons it has its spot in pop culture is because of how weird it is. Yeah. Yeah, you're not wrong. It's definitely a weird one, but that's why I like it. And it also taught me the important lesson of mind your sandwich. <laughs> Be mindful of your sandwich. I so, need a sandwich. Oh, sandwiches. We Sandwiches sound amazing. We should go get a sandwich. 
So time for the plugs. Just a reminder, check us out at nextlevelnerd.com where the opinions are so good they ought to be facts. And be sure to like, subscribe, and share all of our podcasts with friends and family, such as the Nerd Herds Gaming Podcast, Sugar Frosted Cereal, the TV podcast, currently discussing Daredevil. We're on season two, about ready to wrap that up and start season three. And 321, the live action role play podcast. And just a reminder, we want to keep creating quality shows for our listeners and keep growing the NLN community. And the Nerd Herd has been discussing the creation of several new shows on topics such as beer, nerd parenting, comics, music, and a roundtable discussion about random topics. Uh, For 2019, we've got some big plans. But in order to be able to create more content, we need your help. So if you're enjoying what we've done for you this holiday season and the shows that we've been making for you on a regular basis every week, we also want to ask that if you could help us out, just consider going to patreon.com slash nextlevelnerd, leaving us a dollar or more, and because we love you, donating at any level will get you exclusive access to bonus episodes every month and help us reach our goal of creating these shows and video versions of our shows and all the fun shit we want to do in 2019. So if you can't support us with cash, you can support us by giving us a review on iTunes or wherever you cast your pod so other people can find us easier and we can grow this some bitch into something special. But like I said, be sure to like, share, and subscribe so you can catch our next episode when we'll be talking about Coneheads. I'm springing that one on you, Mitchell. We're going to be taking a week off, at least, uh, to kind of enjoy the holidays with our friends and family. Um, You know, so we may not be uh, back for a week or two, depending on how the recordings go. Um, But when we come back, we'll be doing Coneheads. Uh, If you want to watch along, it's currently not streaming anywhere, but it's on sale right now, probably just this week only. So I don't know why I'm telling you that, because we're recording this a week ahead of time. But right now it's on sale on iTunes for $4.99. So until next time, spread the word. Spread the nerd. You know we yeah, boy. Back up off this shit. Representing Cashmere one nine. <laughs> yeah, I just I never got into it. Um Thank you for saying excuse me. That means a lot. At least you've learned something. Your pop filter's gonna stink, but <laughs> what the hell is wrong with me? So, anyways, the uh, the <laughs> I can't move on from rent.